with Aleko. And tonight, Aleko, who is a graduate of our seminary, someone who has ministered to our holy metropolis in various forms, as a pastoral assistant, as a lay assistant, as a chanter, uh, someone who exclusively also has worked with Panari Camp and many other facets. And now he is also, you're not the secretary, you are the director of the St. John of Damascus uh, Byzantine Choir of the Holy Metropolis of Chicago. President. The president, the president, vital. The God of the And we, uh, we thank him for his efforts. <laughs> And, uh, but it's a great blessing, and uh, Alec always offers such edifying words of faith and inspiration, and we look forward to hearing his uh, lecture tonight. So, without further ado, uh, Alec, Alex, please come up, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you. I want to thank thank Father Christopher for inviting me to come and speak. I came here, I think, a few years ago, 2019. I can't remember if I did another time too as well, but it's always nice to be here. Uh, it's always nice to see, as he said, I see relatives, I see friends, I see people from other parishes I knew, I see relatives of friends, so it's nice to see everybody, but I thank again Father Chris, and you're blessed to have Father Chris, and Father Chris, who I, I've known, and very down-to-earth, loving, uplifting, always friendly, joyful people, I know, I from what I know, from what I know, <laughs> but it's always nice to, to be here, so again, I thank you. They said I grew up at Holy Apostles. I worked at a few different churches as pastoral assistant, youth director, and I also ran into a Panari parent here too. But also Panari is also part of what I did too. And I also wanted to mention it was so nice to see so many people in church remaining here, and so many people helping at the chant stand and also in the altar. So it's quite a blessing because I've been to different churches. I was they have like 15 people from the you know, from the Solea. It was, it was great. So God bless. So you might know what I'm speaking about tonight, but I'm not going to tell you. So if you don't know, I'll put you in a little suspense. But I'm going to begin by introducing you to Kathy Koblenz. Now, I don't know her, but about a week ago I read an article online that she wrote in May of 2020. So let's switch gears now. May of 2020, think where we were at at that point. Mainly in our homes. Rush hour didn't exist in Chicago. Stores were empty, this and that. It was sort of the beginning of this. To me, it was like the beginning of the, uh, you know, one of those end of world movies. We didn't know what to expect, a lot of unknowns. So I don't know much about Kathy Koblenz, but she was a rare books cataloger in the New York Public Library, New York City Public Library. And sadly, I read that she passed away about a year ago. So two years ago, she wrote something, a little article that I found. And she begins by saying in this article, I'm working from home. And I thought I would write about some treasures that have passed through my hands in the recent months as a rare books cataloger. So public librarian who deals with rare books. And from the article, this is how she introduces it. First up, she was going to share about a 1492 Venetian edition of a book from one of their collections. It's not a very, very beautiful book, not that uncommon, but it had some beauty. Like all books printed before 1501, it's a date significant in their world there, while well, all the printing was still in its cradle. So it was, they call it a cradle book, sort of when printing began like that. So it had some uh, value just because it was one of the beginning books that were starting to be published and printed. So in this book, it talks about a 6th century Syrian author that's revered by all of Christianity. And she continues saying, you wouldn't expect a guy who lived that long to be a subject of a Wikipedia war. But so it is. I think she was involved in it, but basically they were trying to debate this person who wrote the book. When was he actually born? Back and forth, back and forth. And she said the original author lived by choice, the way many of us are now living out of necessity. So think, May 2020, he lived by choice, the way we're living out of necessity. And most people then, what we were isolating, right? Keeping a uh, flatten the curve, we were saying, right? So the author, she continues, trained himself to the practice of Christian virtues. In this isolation, he lived, she says 20, but I'm going to tell you it seems a little bit longer than that. And she says, this is what you could call, 15th century book from the 6th century author, she says what you call one of the first self-help books. Mm. So Kathy Koblenz, librarian, that's her sort of take on what she finds. 
Now again, you might know what I'm talking about. Am I talking about the same person? If you don't know what I was going to discuss today, I'm going to do sort of a senior suspense. And the article eventually gives it away. Okay, sort of spread, tells us a little bit more each time. It's a sixth century saint, and he writes about the ascetic life, the okay, life of Ascesis, portrayed in the form of a ladder. That might be a big giveaway. That the monks might ascend. Each step on the ladder represented a virtue that must be acquired or a vice that might be eradicated. And there are 30 steps. And then she continues her words. This has bestseller written all over it, doesn't it? Yeah. We are all ascetics now, she continues, all practicing social distancing, not only from each other, but from friends and strangers and loved ones alike. But for most of the things of the physical world, we once thought essential to our being. This is her speaking. It is hard to make peace with this with what is necessary just now. Perhaps some of the lessons of the ladder of paradise, which is one of the titles that was given in the beginning, could be applicable to our fraught lives today. And then she continues talking about some paintings and icons about this author, who we know now as St. John, who we call him of the ladder, okay? St. John Climacus, St. John Climacus. Okay, and Kathy ends by saying, the, author, the librarian, not everyone makes it all the way to the end of these self-help books without falling off the program. So I don't know about you, but I was amazed by doing, because I did a little research to prepare for this, I was amazed that one of the things I found spoke about a 21st century public librarian writing during the pandemic, talking about a 15th century book about a sixth century author and uh, how to achieve holiness and go forward with that. I was amazed that in searching for St. John Clematis, I found this article. And how amazing that this one woman sort of saw this treasure from a historical, from a librarian point of view, all that, but also for the content. And she wrote, this is the name of the article she wrote, how to achieve spiritual, spiritual perfection in 30 easy steps. <laughs> now, a little bit more, I don't know how easy they are, but that was her take. In one way, perhaps, we'll see. A lot of the things of our faith are easy, right? Sometimes we make them difficult. Okay, but that was her take on that. So she was talking about St. John of the Ladder. And I think if she could find something interesting about him and beneficial, I think we as Orthodox Christians can as well. So what do we know about St. John of the Ladder? St. John. We know he was born in this, roughly the 6th century, 579 is the date I found, Syria, Palestine. Okay, if you maybe talk to some of the area, they might debate where Syria, Palestine, I think, could be sensitive about what's what there, but sort of that whole area there. Okay, we don't know his parents, although I saw one little snippet that says St. Xenophon and Maria were his parents, but I also saw that that was wrong. There is another John that's referenced here. So just I don't want to confuse you, just throw that out. We don't know anything about his parents. If you see something, I found that it was a mistake about that. And we seem to we know that he was well educated, and at 16 years old, he went to the base of Mount Sinai, where he obediently followed an elder. And this is not what he wrote as we begin going through some of his texts. Exile, St. John wrote, is a separation from everything in order that one may hold on totally to God. So for four years he was under Elder Martirios, and then eventually he was tonsured at 20 years old. And there was some talk amongst other elders, but that this would be a great light of the world. This person was going to be someone special. And even an elder, St. John the Sabaiti, met young John, maybe in a tradition there, but he entered wherever he was at. He washed his feet. Sometimes they were doing those days. And he didn't really know who he was, but he said, said, like, I feel like I've washed the feet of the abbot of the Sinai Monastery. So something he saw, he didn't know who this young guy was, he didn't know anything, but he saw something special in him. So, a little timeline. You see here. So for 15 more years, he was under the elder, and one of the things he was really for was for obedience. Okay, he talked about obedience, and I'll reference that a little bit later. Okay, and he eventually, when the elder fell asleep, through the advice of another Yeronda or monk there, okay, and he always was open to listening to people, right? Obedience. He went and lived a life of solitude for 40 years of the year. Okay, so for 40 years. We struggle sometimes with 40 days left, okay? So this is for 40 years, right? 
eventually, so there's a little timeline. Again, dates sometimes could be different. This is what I sort of found as far as his age, okay? 16, he went through the monasteries, he was conquered for 20. 35, he went off to the wilderness. About 75, she became the abbot of the monastery at the base of uh, Mount Sinai. And then about four years later, that's also when he wrote the latter, which was a request by a neighboring abbot from a monastery, and I'm going to show you a little map, maybe about 10 miles away, but he said, we've heard things about your monastery, write some guidelines for our monks. And that's how he sort of came up with what he called the latter. And then he fell asleep in the Lord about 79. Again, could be some debate on the dates and how old he actually lived, but that's the basic time on his life. Now, there's the Sinai Peninsula, right? So we have Africa and the whole land up there. Just to give you an idea of where he was at. Okay, and this is sort of a zoom in now. Okay, right over here, see these dots? This is a zoom in. So there's St. Catherine's Monastery. I think this is, I remember that, maybe the, the peak, they have marked as sort of the peak of the mountain there. Quick side note, I love the 40 Martyrs. There's a chapel of the 40 Martyrs also close by. So if you ever have maybe the opportunity to visit, check out the Holy 40 Martyrs. And down here, about 10 miles away, is where the monastery, where the monk asked him, can you write something for our monks? Now remember this dot now. This dot was actually, a little zoom in, okay, that is, I've heard it's been three or five miles, but that's roughly, according to my little uh, calculations, where he lived, okay, so in a cave. All right, so that's where he was for 40 years. Pretty much isolated, but they said there's also others, hermits like that, that were also living by. So, you know, he's probably had some interaction. Okay, we don't know too many details. Again, that's the extent of what we know about his life. Okay? So, getting back now to the ladder. I said it was called the ladder of paradise. Just like the ladder, we say the ladder of divine ascent, ascent. And it has 30 steps. Okay? And 30 steps. We think the 30 years Christ lived, I've heard, wanted to take on this, the 30 years he lived before he started his active ministry. In icons, you might see 30, you could see 33, but in the book, you see 30, okay? One little side note. When do we celebrate? Now, I used to do camps. So I was always used to throwing out starbursts or tweets like that. I didn't come prepared. But Father Chris said he's gonna give whoever gets the thing, gets this right, a free hero at the festival. <laughs> I made that up, but you can make it with him. But just let's do a little school Sunday uh, Sunday school trivia just to see. When do we remember St. John of the Ladder? No. Could be a trick question. I was supposed to speak next Wednesday, but we had some scheduling changes. Okay. So well, next Wednesday is March 30th. So that's where I came up with the idea. Let me speak about St. John. Oh. Even though Vesper sort of celebrates the next day, but we celebrate him on March 30th. But yet, just like you know, I'm missing out speaking about him, the church, because 30th often fell during Lent, they moved the feast. Okay, and but before we get to his feast, let's just go through all the Sundays of Lent. This is our trivia. What is our first Sunday of Great Lent? The Sunday of Orthodoxy. Father Chris, keep track, you know. <laughs> so it's Sunday of Orthodoxy, okay? The triumph of Orthodoxy. Our second Sunday, we just celebrated this past Sunday. St. Mary of Palama, sometimes called the second triumph of Orthodoxy for the teachings that he, he bared in the 14th century, okay? And I, I just learned this actually tonight, looking, but it used to be St. Polycarp, I heard it was commemorated on the second Sunday of Lent. But then, I read it tonight. It's back, I don't know, but then they added St. Gregory after that whole situation happened. What's this next Sunday? Holy Cross. Holy Cross. The veneration. Stava Pusquenicios. And I call it a spiritual halftime. I say it's a Super Bowl. Brother Chris. Football. Are you more hockey? But it's a Super Bowl. The coach is in the locker room. He's holding up the trophy saying this is our goal. How are we doing? How can we do better? So that's also the same Sunday of the Holy Cross Veneration. Our hymns say the Invincible Trophy, the Cross of the Invincible Trophy. It's held up there to encourage us. We're halfway through Lent. Let's continue for the other 20 days of Lent. Okay, and now, what's the fourth Sunday? St. John of the Ladder. 
Why? Because at this point, maybe we're getting a little tired. It's a nice little dose of some spirituality that we could read from St. John of the Ladder. Plus, I said he was celebrated on March 30th, right? Often, you wouldn't have celebrations because Lent was more limited with the services. Okay, so what did they do? They moved it to the fourth Sunday. So they were able to pluck it out of the daily cycle, put it on the Sunday, the Lenten cycle like that, so we would still give honor to the saint. And what's the fifth one? St. Mary of Egypt. Okay, she's celebrated on what day? Like it's a little bit too. Oh, all right. He doesn't have to give it to oh, you. He gets his own. <laughs> April 1st. In the same way, though, because it's during Lent and it might be overlooked, they put it on a day. Okay, Sunday. It's the fifth Sunday. And then I read one take. Maybe it's just a casual take. But they said if St. Mary of Egypt could change your ways, then anyone could change your ways. So it's sort of like the last fall model. Whatever you've been doing for the first, what is it, uh, 34 days? You got to do better, make the change. If she could do it, anybody could do it. So that's sort of the last reminder before then we get into eventually holy. So good, just a little review of that. So St. John of the Ladder on the fourth Sunday, March 30th on the fourth Sunday. Now let's just talk a little about the ladder. Now, I love graphics and I'm sort of like a math guy, so I think like that. But I got very dizzy trying to construct what I'm going to show you, so don't worry about it. I just sort of want to break it down. Metropolitan College is where in an introduction he writes in one of the books, uh, Book of the Ladder, he writes in his introduction, sort of categorizes sort of the different segments of the ladder, okay? Now again, this might overwhelm you, just take it for what it is. But he talks about the first section, the first three runs, talking about the break with the world, okay? Renunciation from the world, okay? That's his first section. The next multiple parts of sections is called the practice of virtues. Okay, the active life it has different things. It talks about fundamental virtues, obedience, penitence, remembrance of death and sorrow. Okay, and then the struggle against passions, which now he breaks down even smaller. The passions predominant on physical anger, malice, slander, talkativeness, falsehood, despondency. And then the material passions, gluttony, lust, avarice. Non-physical continuing, insensitivity, fear, vainglory, pride. And then the practice of virtues, the higher virtues of the active life. Okay, so parts of it talk about sort of these are vices that we have to overcome. Okay, sort of brings that up. And then it also sort of complements that with then talking about virtues. So it's a progression. It obviously was made to sort of give us a start and an end. But we can also take it, you know, wherever we take it. You know, not necessarily that logically we climb ladder step by step, right? And we'll see an icon at the end. But we can also take what we can from each section as well. And then the final section is union with God. So basically, break from the world is the first one, number one. And then the practices of virtue is a good chunk of the middle. And the last one is union with God, where it talks about stillness, prayer, dispassion, and love. So that's sort of the breakdown, just to sort of get, help get us an idea. Again, so you'll see, you know, uh, pride. Obviously, he's not saying be prideful, but it brings up something we should not be doing. How can we go overcome that? You also see love, okay? So it sort of gives us from a negative thought and a positive, how we can fight against something, but also how we can implement something in our lives. Okay, so that's the ladder. So what I want to do now, I have found it very challenging to try to find, like, certain things to talk about. Because, I mean, if there's 30 steps, even if I said a minute about each one, we're here in a half hour. But then there's multiple parts of the steps. Some steps have two pages, others have maybe 15. Okay? So I tried to take some things from a few of those, which I had sort of in bold here, the underlined in bold, some of them. And I want to share a few thoughts. Sometimes I just want to read something, okay? Just to sort of look at the different aspects of that. So the first one I want to talk about is renunciation, step one. Peri amutahis, withdrawal. It's a Greek word. So St. John begins by writing this. Of all the created and rational beings endowed with the dignity of free will, some are friends of God, some are his true servants, some are useless servants, some are entirely estranged, and then there are some who take their stand against him. So, not necessarily going to withdraw yet, but Sort of a, an interesting way to sort of some reflection for Lent. 
the way he breaks down these things. Where are we? I read a little book about this. Where do we sort of fall in this? Yeah, I have five things here, right? You think most Christians are more at the top, but I think they can maybe stretch down, perhaps all the way down, but maybe to the top four. But if we are friends of God, okay, and I'm, uh, in John we hear, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. He's telling to the disciples, but I have called you friends. For all the things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. The Orthodox Study Bible says a nice thing. Friendship is higher than servanthood. A servant obeys his master out of fear. A friend is a servant who obeys out of love. So at this point, if we're friends of God, so we're doing basically, not that it's just we're breaking it down sort of a you know good deep type of faith, right? But we're doing what we do out of love for God. Okay, so that's sort of the ultimate goal like that. Like Christ said to his disciples, you're no longer my servants, but you're my friends. Okay? The second one is a true servant. Now, servants doing something in fear might sound a little harsh with God. But I sort of make this one want to be like, we try doing the best to follow what our, our, teach, our church teaches. We pray, we try to fast, all this. Okay? We're doing it. Maybe we haven't fully grasped it yet, but we're going through the motions perhaps. So that's the way I like to think about it. It's not a bad thing. But we do, we do what we're doing. We do what we should be doing. But we haven't reached the next step. Pray can become, pray, prayer sometimes might be more quantity before it becomes quality. Okay, quantity for quality. I say many times, like, you know, we have a prayer book. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I've read a prayer book, and I've read, sometimes I read the communion prayers. For whatever reason, I read them all, and I'm like, I didn't know what I read Sort of goes, but sometimes that routine, the quantity, gets us into the quality. Okay, and then the useless servant. We are all baptized Orthodox Christians. So how can we be useless? Think of the parable of the talents, right? It's not necessarily, it's not necessarily how many talents you're given, but what you do with them. Okay, you might have one, two, or five, but what do you do with them? So we can fall into that useless servant, even as Orthodox Christians, right? We're not living up to our potential. And then finally, entirely estranged. Now you can say, oh, I don't know anybody, it's got people that are, that could be friends or family. Not bad people, right? But perhaps people that are not in the life of the church. Okay, and that's our call perhaps to reach out to those people as well. And then the last one is those that stand against them, actively against the church. Which could be a plethora of things. But basically with this, these four things that St. John introduces, I think it's a great time for us during Lent to sort of reflect, where do we fall in these categories? Where perhaps can we grow beyond that? Okay, and again, the quantity can sometimes take us to the quality. So that was the first part. And in terms of renunciation, continuing in John chapter 15, if the world hates you, Christ is speaking now, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. And you because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So we are called to live in the world, but not be of the world. We are part of the society, but yet we have a higher calling. Okay, and I, I think it's in John where Christ says, you know, do, do what I teach you so people know that you are my disciples. <laughs> Not again in a bragging way, but we should, we're the salt of the earth, right? We should have add a flavor to this society, to this world, right? That's what we're called to do. So this first one with renunciation, more to me is sort of let's reflect where we're at, perhaps, in our connection with God, okay? The next one I want to skip up now to step four. Obedience, peri pacois. In monasteries, obedience is a very important thing. We've heard sometimes stories of abbots that tell young monks to do pointless things. Sometimes it's something that sounds like they're torturing them sometimes to teach them a lesson because they know something that we don't know. Okay, but we hear this and um, we read in St. John's life, as I mentioned, he was about obedience. Okay, he, he went Four years he was a novice, then he studied for 15 years under there, then by the uh, uh, suggestion of someone else he went out to the desert. So he was about obedience. And here's what he says about this, which is very interesting. He who subs submits himself passes sentence on himself. If, if his obedience for the Lord's sake is perfect, so if he's obedient, if it's perfect for the Lord's sake, even if it does not seem perfect, he will escape judgment. But if he does his own will in some things, 
Then although he considers himself obedient, he lays the burden on his own shoulders. I mix things up. What's that saying? A monk, if he goes under the obedience of an elder, even though he might not be perfect, he's basically surrendered his life in a monastery to the elder. And it says he will sort of takes judgment off him. He's just being obedient. And that is one of the things that we hear about monasteries, that it's about the obedience. And not necessarily anything, but about the obedience. Okay, but if you do things of your own will and falter, then it sort of falls on you, right? So that's what he's saying. So that's why he chose this, this path of obedience. Now, that can be hard for us to grasp in our society. But I think of our parish. Okay, we have our priests and our spiritual fathers. <coughs> Okay, so a lot of I know several people in my life that don't have doctors, or they're like never doing what the doctor says, or they never you know they never finish their antibiotics. They go till day five, and then they miss the rest of five days. All this stuff. Okay, and I'm always telling them. To me, I always think about it's cut and dry. You know, call your doctor, tell them you got this, see what they say. Maybe it's a medicine, maybe it's therapy, this or that. Follow the course. To me, in my mind, I'm a math science guy. It's very like straightforward, okay? But at the same time, sometimes I don't see it as straightforward in the church. Even like, so I'm gonna confess that. Sometimes I don't think about it that simply when we look to our spiritual health. And really, it should be the same way. You ready for this now? <laughs> <laughs> we have the physician of the body and the physician of the soul. <laughs> so, our spiritual father, or our, our father confessor, our parish priest, okay, and the, the clergy could clear this up. But I, I feel from my experience in the church, a lot of times we'll listen to psychologists or analysts or this or that, but sometimes if the priest says something, you know, ah, it's a little papasri. I got with the guy. Yeah, listen to that. Sometimes we challenge that. Now I can be biased, but that's sort of my take on that. But the the idea of obedience, okay, we have also in the church. Now I also believe that a spiritual father, from the relationship I have had with the best spiritual fathers, and I think it's also about two guiding, and then they give you that free will. So I might say, I might both say, I don't think sometimes we. We necessarily go to the obedience of the monastery because they're the monastery. You've chosen to give up your life and sort of commit to their obedience. But we also shouldn't disregard or disrespect that priest, but take their advice. But I think ultimately, to me, what I think is healthy is that the priest gives you that free will to make the decision, guides you, and then the end it's on, it's on you, right? Because I think God does the same thing. He gives us that free will. So that's one idea of obedience that we can practice in the society. Some other things. I read this interesting little commentary on this. Simple things, okay? Let's not think we're all going to the monastery, right? And we're going to be doing what they tell us. But how about this? I see a lot of young people here. I remember a priest once told me, be obedient to your parents. Simple things. And I used to say at a church I used to do that, we argue five minutes about a 10-second task, right? So pick up your ruha. Yes, mom. Yes, dad, right? But otherwise, we argue for 10 minutes. So I remember a priest once told me, just do simple things. Even, even me, sometimes elderly parents, maybe they ask something. You know, I'm always about to leave. My dad says, you know, put my stocks online or something. Do this or that. It's always like when I'm about. But sometimes we've got to take that minute. I used to work at a church several times. One time I was in my car leaving, and someone comes in. And I said, oh, boy. Sometimes I want to be traffic. I want this and that. And I said, what do you need? Oh, can I light a candle? And I'm not doing this for a pat on the back. But I said, okay, I'll go in. But I used to tell myself, you know, my five minutes is five minutes. Maybe I'll have another five minutes of traffic, this or that. And I used to tell other people I worked with, you know, we give five minutes, but it could have been the biggest difference for that person. Maybe they have a sick one that's loved, a loved one that's sick. They want to light a candle. Our five minutes could be the world to them. So I think that is also how we can be obedient, in a sense, to people. Also, I used to joke at the seminary, I used to call some, some of my classmates spiritual uncles. But we're also a community here, right? We can also be, in a sense, obviously if we're being guided out of love, but you know, to also sometimes, I guess, obey some suggestions to people. A lot of times people that love us, right? 
they know sometimes what's good for us. Maybe we're not seeing it, but in a sense, we can also do obedience in that way. And the last one, obedient to the saints. How? Okay? By also taking their life and seeing how we can implement that into our lives. And there's a, something I heard once, itimisi to aiu, ine mimisi to aiu. To honor a saint is to imitate the saint. We can read all the stuff we want historically about St. John, but we got to implement what he did in his life as best we can in our life. And that's how we truly honor the saints. So that's about obedience. Despondency. Akivia. And I translate sort of spiritual laziness or spiritual slacker. Also some of the despondency definition, a state of low spirits caused by loss of hope or courage. So it could be a little bit of both of that. And here's what St. John talks about. And when the table, like over here, when the table's all ready to go and the food's ready, we jump out of bed. But he says, but the hour of prayer has come, and again the body is weighed down. He had to begun to pray, but it steeps him, to, it steeps him in sleep. And, Tyr and Tyrus' response to Shredge, okay, with untimely yawns. That's sort of what he wrote. But I used to think sometimes at the seminary, another confession, but. Sometimes we would miss chapel. We were tired or this or that, but would we miss breakfast? Or we were sick. Well, chapel, I would sit through that, but my class, you know, if I miss, I gotta do my notes. I gotta, I gotta feed the flu or whatever, right? So I go eat. So, you know, sometimes this sneaks in, this laziness, this spiritual slacker, slackiness, okay? But it also talks about despondency, basically, losing hope. In all our struggles and everything we do in the church, right, we should never, you know, if we ever feel sometimes, you know, that we've just, you know, we've given all we get and we, you know, we can't make any further, this is telling us never lose hope, okay? And St. John of Chrysostom says something very nice. If you have, if you have sins, do not become despondent. So I'm going to say, if you have any struggles, okay, don't, don't let them weigh you down. This is what he says. Don't lose hope. I often tell you this, and it, and it will never stop. And even if you sin daily, then you should repent daily. Just as when you have an old house and repair, and the repair parts that begin to decay, and repair parts that begin to decay, removing the rotten pieces and replacing them with the new, with the new. The same should be done with your soul. Do you never forget to repair your house in the same manner you should never forget with your soul. Okay, so we should never lose hope. Okay, and all we can do we fall in whatever we're trying to achieve, just keep on going. And my little quirky one time saying, I, I was talking to someone, I said, you know, don't worry sometimes about what's behind us, about what you did, but worry about your, what you're going to do, okay, moving forward, okay? So that's sort of a little touch on uh, the spiritual laziness, Akidia. Step 16, avarice, greed, or petty philagidias. A philo of silver, anargiri, the unmercenaries didn't collect silver, right? But I don't know what the roots are, but argiri and silver, they were friends. So someone that loves of money, right? And it also touches a little bit of poverty. As you saw, uh, Bishop next public high, so some of them you can sort of scrunch together sometimes, but a little bit on poverty. St. John says this, the beginning of love of money is the pretext of almsgiving, and the end of it of it is hatred of the poor. So long as he's collecting, he is charitable. But when the money is in the hand, he tightens his hold. Mm -hmm. So he's saying here, sometimes I'm working hard so I can help people, and then as soon as we have our pockets full, we we'll get stuck with that, right? So sort of we go in sort of false pretenses, but then we get stuck on it, and it's not, it's easy to collect it, but it's not as easy, the, pocket, the hand goes in the pocket, but not as easily out of the pocket. Mm -hmm. Or someone told me once, alligator arms. They also reach the, the basket to help. So we know as Christians we should not make idols of money or material things of the world. And where though the monastic life perhaps is a cult of poverty, we do obviously have obligations and bills and responsibilities. So one commentary I, I read said, let's not focus this on, on poverty, but perhaps simplicity. Do we add unneeded stress and obligations to our lives beyond what perhaps is necessary? Live simply. It's a good time during Lent, perhaps, to cut back and live simply. A lot of times, maybe we bring on some of these burdens. And it's also a great time during Lent, too, one of the three pillars of Lent, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, to remember about helping those. Quick story. I'm 
going to paraphrase, the story of St. Peter the Merciful. I don't remember his date or what century that, but I'm going to sum it up quickly. He was a pretty stingy guy, and it sort of became amongst the homeless and the beggars there, it sort of became like a challenge. How could we get him, like, who can get something from Peter, right? <laughs> Who's going to be the one that's going to get it? So every day he walked by, you know, they bother him, they bother him, people, 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 they challenge, you know, you fight them all, this and that. <clears throat> Eventually, as he was walking by, he was coming back with his uh, groceries or whatever, his loaf of bread. Just to shut one of them up, he took a loaf of bread and he threw it at him. You know, like, awesome man, here you go, have your bread, leave me alone. Okay? <laughs> so that evening, or whenever, maybe later on, but he had a dream. And in his dream, again, I'll put it in terms that we can rationalize in our minds. In his dream, he saw uh, fallen angels and angels coming down. And they had sort of the old-fashioned scale, right? The two sides. And he saw on the one side... They're putting the rocks on there, his, his sins, right? The greed, whatever else. And he's saying in his dream, I know this is real because I know my sins, right? And he said, oh boy. Then on the other side, he sees an angel come. And he has a loaf of bread. He puts a loaf of bread on the scale. And that one loaf of bread outdoes all the other things. Hmm. So he says to himself, if one loaf of bread that I gave begrudgingly just to shut him up can do so much, imagine if I gave from the heart. Again, going back to what I said sometimes, the quality, the quantity versus the quality. Imagine if it's an act of love, not just, you know, it's, you know, it's a season. That's good too, right? We give at Christmas time, but it becomes more of a lifestyle. Okay, so that is almsgiving, what the benefits it can have to our soul, okay, without us, you know, realizing sometimes. Moving along. I'm going to be wrapping up a little bit. Uh, two more. And I got a few other things to say too. <laughs> but prayer, Betty feels at peace. I don't know if practice is a word. Because, oops. Oh, that was a, okay, one who practices high and perfect prayer says, I would rather speak five words with my understanding, and so on. But such prayer is foreign to infant souls. Therefore, imperfect as we are, we need not only quality, but a considerable time for our prayer, because the latter paves the way for the former. So here again, just touching on what I said earlier, you know, sometimes we hear, don't pray like, you know, with needless repetition like that, but sometimes we need that quantity to help us get to the quality. <coughs> and this is what St. John also mentions there in, one, in step 28. He also mentions, which is very important in prayer, what do we usually pray for? Well, we usually pray for things, right? Right. Whatever it might be. Even if it's good, I mean, say, I want a million dollars, you say, I pray for the health of someone, but we're usually having requests. Okay, and I read once one of those snail, those email chains, it was like a cartoon, and it had God's, like, uh, God's desk, and he had his tools, old-fashioned little inboxes, requests, thank yous. <laughs> the request was like this, and the thank yous, you couldn't see above the, the, the recess part. There. So St. John also tells us, before all else, let us, since let us first give sincere thanksgiving and put that at the top of our prayer, our, our prayer card. On the second line, we should put confession and heartfelt contrition of soul. Then let us present our petition to the king of all. This is the best way of prayer. Okay, and we see here, this is a Fanari thing one here, but rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. A good reminder to always count our blessings. Okay, and we're blessed with many things. So always to Take that time to also thank God for those. And then the last one, love. For Periagapi says, Bibos and Pistils, faith, hope, and love. And we hear in Corinthians, and now by faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And we also know love, many passages about love, but greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for one's friend. The ultimate sacrifice, right, to lay down your life. But any type of sacrifice is an expression of love to our neighbor. And we know, as we hear in the Bible, the two greatest commandments, love. And the Ten Commandments and really everything else is based off that love of God and love of the neighbor. We talk sometimes of the vertical relationship. We have love of God and then love of neighbor. And they sort of go hand in hand. Because if you say you love your neighbor, say 
Say you love God, don't love your neighbor. It says what? You are alive, right? So we also have to, this is the whole idea of love. And we I'm sure we've heard the passage also in Corinthians. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or cunning symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge and have all faith so that I can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long in this kind. I would say someone who loves does these things, right? Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And again, ending. And now abide in faith, hope, love. And these these three, but the greatest of these is love. So that is sort of the the end where he takes us. And quick story, when I was at San Dionisios in Zakynthos, this monk was talking to us who went to Ionian village to visit the relics of San Dionisios. And I remember everything he said, but he at one point he said, Agapo. Was the best thing, the, the number one commandment, and the best word begins with what? Alpha and ends with Omega, Agapo. It goes within this word is every other word. So he said how ultimately Agapo, Alpha and Omega is the, the number one word we have to have in our vocabulary. So to conclude, we looked at the life of St. John and we looked at some of his the steps of his ladder. And although we said it, you know, it was written for a monk, by a monk, for monks, we see that it can be applicable in our life as well, right? As the librarian, I don't know her faith, I don't know anything about her, but how she grabbed this value from this, from this writing. Okay, so we too as Orthodox Christians can do the same with the guidance from our priests, our church, and even from our fellow Christians alongside us. We're all here tonight, okay, so hopefully we get something from the life of St. John, but also, you know, something that we can reflect with each other, encourage one another, invite others next week, right? But it's also what we also do with each, with, with each other. To end, I want to look at the icon, and I have two of them here. I'm going to ask you, because I've talked about anything stick out about these icons. Some of you, I'm sure you've seen these and you know. Okay, this was written, the icons were written after, but they're sort of icons we say are written because when people couldn't read, you know, it could tell a story. We look at the feasts of the Lord, the nativity, the whole story is there, right? I can see the picture. So this tells us a story. Anything? Can someone point out something they know about this? Many falls. Okay, a lot of falls, okay? Yes. So we see, here we see like the brotherhood, right? And we see, even though they're all going up there, there are falls. Some in the beginning, some later on. And then we see these little guys. <clears throat> So the temptations, the struggles, sometimes we fall, right? But we see they're all coming up here. And then ultimately we see here Christ, okay, that our goal what? Okay, and when we look from Jacob in the Old Testament, it's like the ladder to heaven, right? The way we're sort of thinking this out. So this is what you see here, just some of the depictions. Okay, so the ladder could be different. Here's a different little icon, it shows where St. John was writing in his cave. There's perhaps the monastery, and again, going up there. In some icons, you'll see some are looking forward, some are you know, maybe distracted, looking sideways. So it depicts different icons, might say different things. But again, this tells the whole story of the latter divine ascent. Now, I'm going to end. Whoops, I gave you a little point. Yes. <laughs> because I accidentally touched it and made it. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. <laughs> Good. These here, those, these are praying to the Panagia, the blue color. I just did it by accident. That's all right, I'm going to switch for I hope so. So, let me. Concluding, on Decapit Augusto this past year, where I was, at, I was at church, the priest at the church said there's 15 days. 
There's 15 days of Nekam and Abba He challenged us. There's 150 songs. Every day, read 10 songs. So I, was, I think I started two days late, but I was gonna know. I tried playing catch up. And then I don't know where I ended somehow. I got to like 50 or something, and then it was just downhill. Because then, then you're at 100, and now you gotta do 50, and it's just overwhelming, right? So we all have these challenges where we can fail, right? But we always gotta just keep on going. So I'm gonna throw out a challenge to all of you. I talked about how I should have been here on the 30th, technically, and it would have been great, St. John, uh, the latter, the 30th, but it didn't work out. But God works in mysterious ways because I did my math, and if you start tomorrow and go up to Holy Friday, that's 30 days. So my challenge to all of you, I'm gonna give you Holy Saturday day to rest before I get ready for Pascha. But my challenge to all of you is for the next 30 days, to do one thing every day to take different steps. Now, I'm going to make it a little bit easier. The easiest thing, and I have a handout for all of you, if you don't do anything, and just take one and pass, the least you can do is simply read pride. Today he talks about pride, maybe reflect about it. That's the easiest one. The next one is a little bit harder. Read a snippet, and I wish I had stuff or books. It was, it was not all the books are accessible, but read some snippets. Okay, and I, I do have, I'm going to show you something, I have some resources you can do, but read some snippets about one of the wrongs. Okay, or maybe just part of the wrong. Some of them are long. Okay, just read part of them. And then the hardest one is to reach, read, well, this is actually reading the text. Read the actual text. Again, some might be hard longer, read part of it, or read the actual text. So try the next 30 days to at least do one of these. If all you do is read what I just handed you out, Carlos, very good. And what I have at the end, technology here. Now, I did some searching online, and I was able to find what I basically gave you is this QR code, and the younger people can explain maybe to the Less young if they have questions, but that tells you the steps. This year, again, I can't say that I read these whole books, but from what I saw, this gives you a link to what I did in my research, just an Orthodox Christian. And sort of basically, she made a book that puts just snippets. I think she does it over the whole year, but just puts snippets from the actual text. Okay? So, again, I hope page 50 doesn't have something for law that I didn't see, but I'm just, I did a quick search, right, just to maybe give you a point of view. So if you scan this, you'll be able to find just little snippets, okay? And the last one, and even if you search on your own, you can actually find, there's two places I found the actual text of St. John of the Ladder. And side note, this one, I signed up for 30 days again, 30 day free uh, Kindle trial. So if you sign up tomorrow, you'll be here for the whole duration, and that's how you can download that one, okay? So you can research on your own, but I just wanted to at least give you those resources. So with that, I don't know if you have any questions or if you want to share anything, but I thank you. And again, this is just a little bit. Any questions for uh, Alex, for Aleko? Any uh, questions, comments, anything? This is maybe... Yeah. Look, I, want, I wanted to commend you for um, mentioning things to subtract because I think in our mindset sometimes social scientists talk about how whenever there's a problem, we want to have a solution that adds something. But sometimes it's just to subtract. So yeah, I think you mentioned a couple of examples of subtracting some of the vices, subtracting some yeah. of the uh, some of the things that are not helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was, that was that was helpful. And I think you know, I think he too does. St. John is just sort of a little balance of both of those, like where he might mention that he follows up with like, you know, here's what, what you can do, then one will maybe overcame that. Anything else? No. Thank you, Alex. So again, I thank you. You know, if a ladder has like a little sticker that says the company of the ladder, we probably like all we touched on was like just a sticker. We didn't even like look at all the other things we can look at in the whole ladder. But there's so much, but for just something maybe to help plant the seed. I learned as well in researching because you know I sure didn't know everything about St. John the Ladder either, right? But you know I learned a lot about his life, and hopefully, I'll say this thing: a lot of times, I'll share a story about quick Saint Nectarios. I had a book of Saint Nectarios, and I loved the book, and I, I was reading about Saint Nectarios, 
And it was actually, I think, a kid from St. Nick Dives at camp. We were talking about it years ago now. And he said, I love St. Nick Dives. And that's why I gave him the book. And I was like, sort of, I didn't want to give it because I said, you know, I like the book. I don't want to give it. I said, uh, you know, he might do more with it. Years later, I, I mean, about two years later, I feel like someone else then gave me the same book back. <laughs> but what I want to say is a lot of times when we, when we are involved and we love and we read about the saints, okay, to me, it's a simple little thing, but sometimes the saints, you know, they're watching out for us, right? Okay, so the lot of little things we might take from this, even if it's just reading that one thing, we never know how through the intercession of St. John might touch our life or bring something else into our life. So again, I thank you. I also enlisted uh, Paso tonight to, to end. We're going to end with a prayer, but we're going to sing the Apolitica, the dismissal hymns of the saints. And then I'll go back to this if anyone wants to take a picture there. Very nice. So we'll hear this, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday. The Greek he knows up excellent. I think so. I don't know. So this was in English, so we'll see how, how this goes. Long on with the rivers of your tears, you made the barren desert bloom. And with your sighs from deep within, you made your labors bear fruits a hundredfold. And you became a star, illuminating the world by your miracles. O John, our devout Father, intercede with Christ our God for the salvation of our souls. Testum lacrium sudois, Iserimoto arbono de Georgisas, Gertisegmatus senagnis, Isegmatus bonus ecar poporisas, Gegegonas fossil, Tinibumeni lacon vista masin, Ioani patiri. Thank you everyone, Asakala, Kali Vista, Rapato Sokalo, thank you for being with us tonight. And God willing, Avrio Mixehasta, Perimene, Avrio in a Megali, your Tito Brati, Sekinapato Sperino, Sokata de Ricotao, this to Evangelismo, yet your tea, this Evangelismo to Theodoko, if I order, sitting night of Megalo Sperino, can me, Soloti Paraskevi. Θα τελέσουμε τις ακολουθίες του όρθου, τη λειτουργία και δοξολογία για την 25η Μαρτίου και τον Ευαγγελισμό προς την Παναγία μας. Αυτές τις ακολουθίες την Παρασκευή το πρωί θα ξεκινήσουμε α, στις 8 και 4. Please don't forget, tomorrow is the Great Vespers for the uh, feast in honor of the Annunciation of Tokos at the Sister Parish of the Cathedral of the Annunciation on the South Street in Chicago. Those services begin at 7 p.m. And then on Friday morning, the feast day of the Annunciation of Theotokos, and the Dipli Yorti, the beautiful celebration of the Greek Independence Day, March 25th, 1821, Orthos, Divine Liturgy, and Doxology. All those services will begin at 8.15 in the morning. Nasa Sakala, Tronia Kola.